Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, Jaden Reads. So if you've been with my channel for a while, then you know I'm doing this challenge called the I Have a Responsibility to Learn Challenge. And basically what this challenge is, is that I want to learn more about social issues that are going on in the world and how I can help with those issues. And so every month of the year, leading until next June, I believe, next June or May, I have picked a different social topic that I want to learn about. I want to read a book about it and then come here and discuss what I've learned. And hopefully some of you will have thoughts and that we can discuss these topics together. So since I did an internship in Thailand this summer, which is where I started this whole channel, and I was working with Burmese refugees, Burmese migrants, I really wanted to learn more about the conflict in Burma. And so for the month of July, I read the book Miss Burma by Charmaine Craig. And this book, just let me tell you right now, is incredible. And I was like, okay, this is kind of a side note and it's kind of embarrassing, but I actually filmed this video, I think like over a week ago. So once you watch a little further into the video, you're gonna notice that I changed like clothes, my outfit changes. That's because I did film this video previously, but I guess somehow like in the editing process when I was sending the video over to my computer, I lost the first half of the video. I don't know what happened, but I couldn't find it anywhere. So I'm refilming the intro, which I guess is kind of a blessing because this book, like I said, was incredible and meant so much to me and taught me so much, especially after having done my internship. And the video that I filmed last week got very fired up. And I'm not normally like, I don't normally argue politics or get super into those kind of conversations. I think politics are of the utmost importance because they, you know, govern our country, they govern our world. But at the same time, I do try to be polite, I try to be respectful, I try to listen to other people's opinions, and I'm aware of the fact that I'm still forming my own opinions. I'm aware that before I traveled out of the country, my opinions were vastly different, and that as I've grown and learned, my opinions have completely changed. And so I can't get mad at anybody for where they are. Okay, my camera just died and I don't know where I was on my tirade. But anyway, <laughs> so basically what I was saying was that my worldview has been shaped by my experiences, by the time that I've had to travel outside of the United States, by the time that I've had to talk with Burmese migrants, with refugees, with people from other countries. My worldviews have been shaped by the classes that I've taken. I'm an international development minor. This is really important to me it's very close to my heart. It's, I feel like, I don't, it just feels like an integral part of the person that I am. Not only that, but I am studying psychology for a long time. I've wanted to go into social work. A big part of my heart and my personality is looking out for vulnerable populations. And I believe that migrants and refugees are vulnerable populations and that they don't have all of the rights that I do, and that's not fair in my mind. And so, yes, the second half of this video does get political, but I chose not to edit any of that out because just as valid as your opinion is, so is mine. And my opinion is informed by fact. I'm not on here to try to like start an argument or to hurt anyone's feelings, and I apologize in advance if my you know viewpoint is different than yours and it makes you uncomfortable, but the fact is, this book made me uncomfortable. Learning about what happened to the ethnic minorities, if you will, in this book, the Karen, the Shan, the Kareni, these people, it made me uncomfortable. And at the end of the day, we're all people and what happened to these people could happen to me. And so I'm going to speak up about it. And yep, once again, I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. I'm not changing how I feel about it. That's my disclaimer. Let's jump into this video. And I promise it's going to be worth it and you're going to want to watch. I just wanted to throw that out there because like I said, I don't normally get political in my videos. Okay, so as I just mentioned, in Burma, there are these people that are considered ethnic minorities. And some of the people that I worked the closest with when I was in Thailand were the Karen people and the Shan people and some Kachin people. Um, I know there's Kareni. There are quite a few like ethnic minorities is what they're called now. But from what I understand, and I may be totally wrong, but these people lived in what is now like modern day Burma. And they were, you know, in their tribes. They were all just living together. 
you know, separate, but anyway, I don't know like the total, like the atmosphere of how things were there, but there were all of these ethnic minorities. This group decided that they wanted to kind of like nationalize Burma. They wanted to Burmanize Burma, if that makes any sense. And so they decided that they wanted to kind of the same as the Holocaust. They wanted one Aryan race. They wanted the Burmans. And so they wanted to wipe out the rest of these ethnic minorities. And so they waged civil war. And so this war has been waged against the Karen, the Shan, the Kareni, the Kachin. And these people have had to flee their homes, flee Burma, and go to other countries where they could be safe, which is why they were refugees in Thailand. And their homes have been completely obliterated. Their records have been destroyed. Their populations have been watered down. A lot of really intense things have happened to these people. And I'm really, I would, I don't like learning about this because it's so disturbing and hurts your heart so much. But at the same time, I feel like this is a history that was totally neglected when I was growing up. You know, like being raised in America, I never learned about this history. I did learn about the Holocaust and that was a horrific genocide, but this is also a horrific genocide. And I can't change what happened, but I can learn about it and I can try to be better and try to fight for these people now, if that makes any sense, which is why this is so important to me to learn about and why I felt like this story was so important. Before I get into the rest of my video and the, like the political half of it, I just want to tell you quickly about what this book is specifically about. So as you can see, it's called Miss Burma. Charmaine Craig, the author, actually wrote this book about her family. She wrote this book about her mom and her grandparents. So her grandfather's name was Benny. I think actually the names were changed for the purposes of this book, but according to this book, her grandfather's name was Benny, her grandmother's name was Kin, and then her mother's name was Louisa. Benny was born in India, but he was a Jew and he was orphaned and then he went to live with his aunts and then he was sent to this like private school and he became a boxer and that was a really big part of who he was and then he ended up joining the British army I believe and so he was stationed in this random part of Burma I want to say and he saw this girl this nanny walking with a little boy one day and he thought that she was so beautiful and so he like followed her to the home she was staying in and he asked the father of the boy that this lady nannied for if he could marry this woman. And the woman was Kin. And Kin had a very horrific past. Um, there were these like bandits in Burma that would, I think they were fighting for the Burman cause, I'm not exactly sure, and they would just come and terrorize ethnic minorities. One night, these like bandits came into Kin's home and they disemboweled her father, they raped her sister, they were violent with her mother, I can't remember exactly what happened, and Kin was there watching all of this happen and trying to save everybody, but it was this very traumatic event in Kin's life. So when Benny came and proposed to her, it was crazy, they had like never met, never talked, but she thought, this could be a different life for me. You know, he's not an ethnic minority, maybe I won't have to live in this fear. And so she accepts this proposal and they get married and they end up having Louisa. And through a course of events, they, they being Benny and Kin, become involved in this Karen movement where the Karen people were fighting against the Burmese and saying like, no, you're not going to Burmanize us. We are going to be ourselves. We're going to stay true to that. Throughout this story, it does like an excellent job of illustrating human nature and familial relationships and marital conflict. And so at one point in the story, Benny and Ken are having a lot of conflict in their marriage. And I don't know why, but like as they're fighting, for some reason, Benny's like, well, if you feel that way, then Louisa should enter this Miss Burma pageant. And I don't know if I just wasn't paying close enough attention. Like, I don't know why that's the conclusion that Benny jumped to, but Kin was really mad at Benny, and so she put their daughter in this pageant. And what this pageant was, it was the first ever beauty pageant in Burma. And they entered their daughter, Louisa, and through certain events, Louisa was a very strong candidate, but Louisa was chosen as the winner. So this was during the civil war between the Burmans and the ethnic minorities. 
And by letting Louisa win this pageant, Burma was trying to say, look, like we're not racist. You know, you claim that this genocide is taking place. You claim that we hate the Karen people or we hate the Sean people, but we let this girl who's half Karen and half like Indian win this pageant. We clearly can't be racist. Oh my gosh, my camera keeps dying and the lighting is horrible. So I'm gonna wrap this up. <laughs> I have so many thoughts about this, I just can't stop talking about it. But no, anyway, so they were basically just saying, because you won, we're not racist, there isn't a problem, all this stuff. And so Louisa was held up as this symbol, almost, it's a weird comparison, but almost if you will, like Katniss in the Hunger Games, when she was seen as the Mockingjay, like this symbol of rebellion, and she was like, hey, listen, like I, I didn't wanna be the symbol, that's not what I'm trying to do. And in the end, like, it still led to good things, like, it led to the rebellion against the capital. But Louisa, in the same way, like, against her will, was forced to be this symbol of Burmanization and unification, but it was not a symbol that she chose, and it was not a symbol that led to good things. It was a symbol that led to kind of more bloodshed and more violence, and so Louisa has to, like, grapple with that and find herself and fight back against that. So that's basically what this story is about. It is written in the format of a novel just because I watched an interview with the author and she said she wanted to be able to kind of explore the character's psyche and to explore the humanness of what was happening and explore those relationships. And so instead of just making it, like, nonfiction or a memoir she wanted it to feel more like a novel and be more enjoyable to read especially because this is a history that isn't known very well especially in america or i guess the united states and so yeah it does say novel and i think some names are changed some characters or events are dramatized but for the most part everything is factual how it truly happened um and if I remember correctly, the clip that's going to start playing, I talk about, well, I read a passage from the book that's like really moving to me, um, that talks about the current political climate. And once again, sorry if this is offensive, but with our president, Donald Trump, saying, oh, if you don't like America, you should just go back to where you're from. And like with the border crisis, this passage that I'm going to read in here has to do a lot with that. That's why it really stood out to me. It takes place between Benny and his best friend, Saleh and they're both talking about like the Karen revolution and should we be involved and why should we care? Why does this matter? Blah 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 all that stuff and so Yeah, just know going into that clip because I think it cut off and I don't think it explains it But Saleh is Benny's best friend and so that's who's talking to Benny there and then I can't remember if this is included Later, so if it is I will edit it out one of my absolute favorite things about this book is that Benny talks a lot about how, you know, he was orphaned and he's Indian, he's Jewish, he's all of these things, but the people that he identifies with the most are the Karens. And I know that this identification thing is a huge, like, hot topic and we love to debate about it, which doesn't make sense to me, but, getting political again, but I really loved the way that it showed Benny's perspective in this. Because if you think about it, you know, he has been orphaned, he has all these other identities, but nowhere has ever made him feel special. He's never felt loved. He's never felt like, oh, you know, this jives with my personality. But he meets Kim, he falls in love with her, he has children with her, like this is his wife, and she's Karen, and they live amongst the Karen people, his best friend is Karen, he starts to adopt their customs and their cultures because he's living amongst them, and he wants to identify himself as Karen. And this book does a really beautiful job talking about race and the boundaries that we put on that, the boundaries that we put on labels and why we try to separate ourselves as humans. And this whole discussion goes on throughout the book and towards the end of the book, Louisa has just been like beaten down as the symbol that I talked about earlier, you know, and she just says at the end like, I don't see race anymore. Like, I don't know why it matters. I don't know why we need to be murdered because we were born Karen, just because people want us to be like more Burman. It doesn't make sense. And I agree, it doesn't make sense. And I think that race is a very hot topic and that, you know, I will never understand what it's like to be Burman. And I can't say, oh, like, 
I don't see race, I don't see color in the fact that these people's lives have been impacted by the fact that they are Karen and that they have had these horrible things happen to them. But at the end of the day, I think that I agree with Louisa and it's like, why do we have race? Why, why do we separate ourselves? I think culture is a beautiful and amazing thing and I think it's something that should be preserved, but not at the cost of my culture is different than your culture, therefore I am better, therefore I can murder you. That is just stupid. And I'm getting all heated up again. I don't even know if I'm making sense. So yeah, I'm gonna cut this video here. I'm just gonna show you the clips that I took like last week. Um, there's also going to be some footage of my time in Thailand and this is a long rambly video. Hope you enjoy. I think this portion of the book does a really good job highlighting why that line of thinking is so problematic and how it would feel if it happened to you. And this hit me really hard because I am American. Anyway, I'm just going to like get into it. So this is Saleh talking to Benny. And yeah, like Benny's trying to talk about what it means to be part of a certain race and all those different things. And so it says, if Benny had felt excluded by Saleh's we before, the frostiness that came over his friend now left him entirely out in the cold. Saleh went to the table where he kept his tobacco and mechanically rolled himself another cigarette, which he lit and held to his lips. You surprise me, Benny, he said after he had exhaled. Aung San's talk of unity. Surely, you know unity is just the word tyrants use before heads begin to roll. But very well. Let us take your American example. I'll pass over the very obvious case of the American Indians, who have been incorporated into that perfect union with such stunning success. Saleh, suppose, the man persisted, but with a trace of his old politeness, suppose that your Americans suddenly found themselves being overrun by Japs, which is racist, but he's talking about the Japanese. Say Hiroshima never happened, and so on. Say that we had lost the war, and suddenly America is overrun. Americans are no longer permitted to speak English in any governmental setting. Their children must learn their lessons in Japanese, learn a history that mocks their minority perspective. Say that in theory, their children can rise to the top rungs of the social and political ladder, but only by adopting Japanese values, a belief in the superiority of Japanese blood, and even a disdain for American primitivism. American religion, be it Christianity or anything else, is, if not formally stamped out, labeled crude, aboriginal. Or say something more radical happened. He had begun to pace, and as Benny watched him, as he listened to him, he felt drawn into an old comfort. Some slip of his old cautious friend had reappeared, had survived after all, in spite of the setbacks. Say that these Japanese rulers institutionalized handicapping Americans by cutting off their hands if they were found with reading materials or writing implements, so that before long, without a written language, without a written history, without access to education, Americans were as ignorant as the Japs said they were. If instead, these Americans refused to relinquish their writing and language and values and culture and history so easily, would that be tribalism, as you call it? So, if that doesn't make this make more sense for you, I don't know what does. And it breaks my heart to think about this and talk about all of this, because especially as Saleh was saying at the end, when he was talking about people's hands being cut off, that's exactly what happened to the Karen people. During this Burmese civil war, if the Karen people were found with writing materials, their hands were cut off so that they could not write their history, they could not write their language and preserve it, and so it was taken away from them. And then they were barred from getting educations, they were barred from going to school, and once they became refugees, like in Thailand per se, it has been a long, hard process to get them any kind of access to education. And so these people do become ignorant and they do forget their culture and their heritage because they can't write it down. They can't record it. And so then they're seen as ignorant and stupid and tribalistic. And why are they holding on to this like history that doesn't even matter anymore and that's gone? And it's like, hello, it's because somebody took it away from them, which is totally not okay. And just... I don't know, just this book had so many good analogies like that, that it's like you can read about this and it's really, really sad. But when you think about it in the context of your own country, it really helps that hit home. That 
this isn't saying that Burmese culture is bad. It isn't saying that Japanese culture is bad. It's saying that what's bad is one race taking over another race and saying that they're more important. Saying that, oh, we don't care about America anymore because Japan is in charge. Just, yeah, I don't know if I'm making sense at all because I'm getting like super worked up. Anyway, that part of the book just hit me so, so hard. And this book was filled with many other like eye-opening moments like this one. And while I shared many of the perspectives that are spoken of in this book, just like the Alice Network or like Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda helped me see things in a different light, helped me understand issues that I didn't understand before in such a human way. And I love that my perspective changed. I love that I feel like I understand things more. And if you're that type of person, if you're open to learning something new, if you don't think that you know everything and that you can benefit from reading about someone else's perspective and history and opinion, then 100% please pick this up. This is a history that has been neglected, especially in the West, but it's a story that we all need to know. They deserve to have their story heard and they deserve our support. I think I took some videos when I was in Thailand. I visited some schools that have been set up for refugees from Burma and some Burmese migrants. To be honest, I was appalled at the conditions of the school. And what made me feel so bad was the administrators of the school kept talking about how amazing the schools were and how like just groundbreaking they were with the resources that they had or the cleanliness or the schedules or all these different things. And I just kept thinking like, this is not adequate. Like this is not how a child should be raised. This is not what they should be exposed to. And it's honestly all because of prejudice. It's because the Thai government doesn't want to help out. And that's not just to point fingers at Thailand. This is happening everywhere in the world. I just want to include these clips so that everybody can see and remember that we are all humans. We all share this common humanity. Okay, so I was clearly very charged while making this video, and so I forgot to like put a little spot where this would fit in, but right now I'm going to insert those clips from my trip. <sighs> That's about you too. This is their rice cooker. For all the kids. Uh -huh. More food. Do they have um, like, uh, yeah. time that's set aside for them to do their homework? Garlic. Honestly, I know that this may not look all that bad, but this is by far the nicest place that we went to. And I don't think my videos accurately capture how many bugs there were everywhere in their food and just how dirty things were. I was just trying to be polite and not sit there with my phone on too long. I know this video has been like pretty political and also included some things that have been kind of hard to talk about. And so I figured I would include some of my like more favorite things that I got to see there. This go is eating my banana peel that I just threw at him. Work it, dude. I tried to feed that little duck goose thing. He was rejected. Come back. Mr. Goat, come back. He was just looking me. Mr. Goat. He's moved on. And honestly, when I was in Thailand and interviewing these refugees and these migrants, I realized like the only difference between the two of us was the chairs we were sitting in. They were sitting in a chair that meant they had to go back to the refugee camp. I was sitting in a chair that said I got to get on a plane and come back to this country and have all the freedom and the wealth in the world that I wanted at my disposal. And it wasn't because I earned it. It wasn't because I did anything special. Sure, I've worked hard in my life. 
sure, you know, I had to work to get on that internship, but this person could have worked just as hard as I have, and they don't have the same wealth or the same opportunities or things simply because of where they're born. Honestly, at this point in time, I'm not even reviewing the book, and so I need to end this video because it's just kind of me like ranting and sharing my opinion and getting like way too political and personal. But I just want to say at the end of the day, we are all human beings and we all matter. And you don't have to agree with what I'm saying and I don't have to agree with what you're saying. That's the beauty of living in this world altogether. Like at the end of the day, this book did so much to teach me about my humanity and what it means to be a person and how people react in struggle and in war and how they're real. You know, how history could be lost through hands being chopped off, through writing utensils being thrown away, through the watering down of a people by Burmese being paid to rape women from these ethnic minorities and father children with them so that literally there would be less Karen and Sean people because they would become more Burman. I don't really know what to say, just that this book was so life-changing for me and I'm so grateful that I read it and it's stepping outside of what I normally read. It might seem a little bit boring at times, but honestly, the amount of knowledge that I gained from this book, the wisdom that I gained from this book was well worth it to me. So I'm really sorry if I said anything that came across as offensive or that came across as too forceful. These are my opinions based on my experiences and partially based on fact, but I don't know, I, if you disagree with what I've said in this video, that's totally fine. But I challenge you to read Miss Burma and then to come back and talk to me about it and talk to me about what you learned from this experience of reading this book. What the genocide in Burma has taught you because I would be really interested to see what it did teach you because we all have different things to learn. I hope that you enjoyed the clips of my trip from Thailand. I hope that this video wasn't like too depressing or like I said too forceful or anything. It was just really really important for me to make this and I'm so so glad that I read this book. Honestly it like means the world to me. So yeah thank you all so much for watching. Like I said earlier next month August I'm going to be learning about the rape of Nanjing and that's probably going to be just as charged of a video as this one so just know that if you want to tune in. But thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!